This video was sponsored by Campfire Blaze, or maybe it's Campfire Blaze's edgy palette swapped alter ego. This may come as a shock to many of you, but I watched a lot of anime in high school. I know, I know. Please withhold all affronted gasps till the end, but it's true. And if there's one trope anime loves more than giant swords, uncosplayable hairstyles, and underage girls with quintuple G-cups, it's super-powered evil sides. It's gotten a little less popular since the rise of what I like to call the soft boy shonen anime, the subgenre pioneered by My Hero Academia, where the shonen protagonist is also a total soft boy, but for a while there, you couldn't turn around without smacking into an anime with a super-powered evil side in it. Now, the concept of the super-powered evil side is simple. Our protagonist is generally a pretty nice guy. Standard hero, maybe a little bit cranky, but overall reliably protagonisty. But it's also standard shonen anime law that the hero probably gets their ass kicked on the regular, since every villain needs to win at least one establishing fight to prove that they are indeed a bad enough dude to threaten the protagonist. Emotion power-ups and friendship speeches can only take your heroes so far. Sometimes they might need a serious boost to get through a particularly bombastic anime fight scene. And this is where the super-powered evil side comes in. The protagonist develops a conveniently timed power-up just in time to save their life, but unlike like your garden variety power-ups, this one comes with a personality shift. The hero's more aggressive, more malicious, more unhinged. Sometimes they might even seem like a completely different person. They go from being on the ropes to having the bad guy on the ropes, and they usually seem to almost be reveling in it. Our hero is winning, sure, but they aren't really themselves, and they could even end up being more dangerous to the other heroes than the bad guy they're currently using as a kickball. This is the super-powered evil side. It's super-powered, it's evil. Exactly what it says on the tin, and satisfaction guaranteed. The super-powered evil side is very useful for two reasons. One, the super-powered part. Power-ups are very convenient because they let your hero win, and since most shonen anime fights are basically just mashing two action figures together until one of them buckles or a limb drops off, a power-up is a nice way to escalate the mashing with some loud glowy auras and a lot more environmental damage. The other useful feature is, unsurprisingly, the evilness. See, this helps counter the inherent bustedness of the power-up. Because having a power-up in reserve usually totally unbalances a good hero-villain matchup, most power-ups come with some kind of price to still give the bad guys a chance post-power-up. Maybe the hero can't do it on command, or it makes the hero weaker in some other way, or it's got some kind of time limit before it becomes too physically taxing to sustain, or it completely debilitates them afterwards so they'll be totally helpless if they don't win with it. But with the super-powered evil side, the trade-off is that the hero straight up becomes evil. This lets the power-up part be as strong as the writer needs it to be because the hero can't just use it willy-nilly, since they'll fully lose control and potentially end up becoming more of a problem than the original problem. Now, the exact nature of the super-powered evil side varies a lot from story to story. While they're all both super-powered and evil, those can mean a lot of different things. For instance, some super-powered evil sides are pretty reliable and consistent and don't change much with repeated use, but a lot of them aren't and instead grow stronger every time they're used. While this would be pretty broken for any other power-up, the evilness helps balance this out by also getting stronger every time. The risk-reward ratio stays pretty much constant as the risk of getting stuck all evil and stuff rises along with the reward of kicking the bad guy's butt. Two notable classic shonen anime leaned on this option, first Inuyasha and then Bleach. Both featured protagonists whose super-powered evil side was almost its own split personality that got stronger and stronger every time the hero lost control. In Inuyasha's case, when the half-demon protagonist's magic sword is broken in the creatively titled episode Tetsaiga Breaks, it turns out it was actually working as a restraining bolt to keep his powerful demon blood in check, and with it destroyed, he gets way the hell stronger and scarier and unleashes a very cathartically satisfying can of whoop-ass on the demon who'd been wiping the floor with him for the last 15 minutes. The problem is, the demon blood is actually corruptive. Like, it's physically too strong for his human side, and every time he transforms, it takes another nibble out of his human soul. This isn't just flavor text. Each time he transforms, he's noticeably more volatile even losing the ability to speak after a while. It basically turns into a chronic medical condition that the bad guys start leveraging to screw with the heroes, since after a while, a sufficiently evil vibe in the area is enough to overwhelm the sword's power and force him to transform, turning him into a mindless, feral, living weapon against his friends. Very dramatic, very cool. Unsurprisingly, it's weak to the power of love and hugs, but Inuyasha's a romance first and a shonen anime second, so that's not really a surprise. Meanwhile, in the case of Bleach, Ichigo's hollow side is introduced fairly early on as a super strong, super violent, maniacal asshole with a really sweet looking looking face mask who mostly just shows up to effortlessly curb stomp the bad guy until Ichigo musters enough heroic willpower to dramatically rip his mask off and go back to getting his butt kicked. He gets progressively stronger and harder to suppress as the story progresses, although after a fairly standard issue battle in the center of the mind, the hollow side chills out enough to turn into a non-evil power-up, with one minor relapse later on where a particularly dramatic near-death experience turns him into a crazy strong super-powered evil side for a little while. But it's actually not uncommon for super-powered evil sides to lose the evil part over time. Lots of people forget this thanks to pop culture osmosis and narrative of Drift, but the first time Dragon Ball Z showed us a Super Saiyan, it was pretty solidly a super-powered evil side. When Goku first transforms during the Frieza arc, it's in a moment of uncharacteristic pure rage, and the first sign that he's not exactly himself is that he doesn't seem to be having a good time fighting. 
This is Goku we're talking about. He's got, like, two brain cells, and one of them spends all its time pinging between the three receptors for food, fighting, and friendship. But no, this Goku is silent, stoic, and completely unfazed by all of Frieza's sassing. He even toys with Frieza, who up to this point has spent several episodes kicking the ever-loving crap out of him, his friends, and his family. The fight suddenly goes from a desperate uphill struggle just to survive to being completely unbalanced in the other direction. Even the narrator calls it an unsettling transformation, and the peanut gallery wastes no time in pointing out that Goku is really not acting like himself and that this fun-loving guru who can't help but enjoy himself even when fighting for his life and the survival of his planet is now completely focused on making Frieza suffer for killing his friend. It was cool as hell and a fantastic payoff for the season's buildup of this mysterious alien prophecy of an ultimate deadly Saiyan warrior and the only thing Frieza truly feared. And then, well, basically the minute they finish the Frieza saga, the Android saga starts. We meet Trunks minute one and suddenly Super Saiyan is the power-up du jour. Everyone and their six-year-old can do it by the end of the arc with zero personality shift or negative consequences. It's explained as basically just being a matter of training. Once you get used to it, it stops being all evil and stuff, but it also strips away all the coolness factor and officially heralds DBZ's long, slow, painful slide into power creep, where every new transformation is essentially one use only before it becomes outstripped by the next villain and rendered completely pointless. Now, power creep probably warrants a little explanation. It's a broader trope that can affect anything with an escalating power level. While it's mostly discussed in the context of anime these days, its original use was in games, where it was pretty common for the average strength of the stuff in the game to go up over time, with every new release being incrementally stronger than the previous ones. This helped appeal to the people buying those new releases, but had the side effect of gradually rendering older game features weaker by comparison, and eventually obsolete. For an example that's a game and a show, Yu-Gi-Oh! or Duel Monsters has some serious power creep. In its first appearances, the coolest thing you could do in a game was draw the strongest monster and then summon it. Then it was fuse monsters together to make an even stronger monster. Then after a while, it turned to summon the coolest legendary god card, and now it's like chain 14 highly specific monster and spell effects to instantly summon your apex monster onto the first turn and win. Pretty sure that kind of deck building never made it into the anime, cause while it's basically a guaranteed win, it's also super boring to watch. And that's actually the biggest problem with power creep, boredom. Which is ironic, because it only exists in the first place to combat boredom. Games and shows alike thrive on dropping in cool new stuff for the audience to keep them interested. And sometimes they drop in cool new stuff that's so cool, or at least strong, that it retroactively invalidates all the previous cool stuff. And that loops back around to being not cool because it makes all the earlier stuff feel pointless. Like. Imagine your hero is questing for Excalibur, right? This amazing, legendary blade wielded by King Arthur Pendragon, destined only for the hand of its chosen and the one true king. And after half a season of trials and tribulations and proving himself, the hero finally gets Excalibur, proves himself worthy, draws the sword from the stone, gets a sweet-looking makeover, and turns the tables on the season antagonists in one glorious stroke. And then next season, they're like, hey, um, bad news. This new bad guy, uh, put up his Excalibur-proof shield, so now you need to get, um... Caliburn. It's like Excalibur, but way cooler. It's got like three more powers. And maybe just to be sure you're gonna do it, we're we're gonna break Excalibur. Just so, you know, you don't get too comfortable. But don't worry, Caliburn is just as cool. We promise! But it's not just as cool. Because even if the sword is new, the story isn't. The first time your hero proves himself worthy and gets an amazing magical weapon, we're all very impressed. The second time, we're less impressed. You'd think two magic swords would be twice as cool, but in practice, you're just telling us we shouldn't have valued the first one so much. Why get invested in a power-up if we know the story is gonna make it obsolete in one fight? Power creep afflicts a lot of power-ups, but super-powered evil sides are a lot less vulnerable to it than more benevolent power-ups, since a normal power-up usually gets nerfed after one use, so it doesn't become the instant win button. But the inherent trade-off of the super-powered evil side means you can use it for drama more than once before putting it on the shelf. Plus, power creep exists to combat boredom and stagnation, but the drama inherent in the evilness can do that pretty well on its own. The superpowered evil side popping up doesn't mean the hero's gonna win and everything will be fine. It just means we've swapped out one problem for another problem that is significantly more nuanced to fix. But it's still not immune to power creep and can sometimes end up disappointingly nerfed by it. After all, if the superpowered part loses its luster, then the risk-reward ratio skyrockets since you're just turning evil for no reason, which is more of a danger than a complex narrative trade-off. Because of this, power creep weakened superpowered evil sides usually lose either the superpower or the evil after a while sometimes both, leading to them just fully losing all narrative relevance and oof. Though they do sometimes get replaced by new superpowered evil sides afterwards. Jumping back to Dragon Ball again, in the original series, Goku had another superpowered evil side in the form of the Ozaru. If he looked at the moon, he'd turn into a rampaging giant monkey. This happened enough to go from cataclysmically dangerous game-changer to, ah, geez, not again, and eventually they just 
kind of stopped having his tail grow back so they wouldn't need to remember that plot point. Then jumping ahead, when Super Saiyan became Old Hat in the Cell Saga, they started incrementing the numbers and gave Gohan a superpowered evil side when he went Super Saiyan nuclear to beat Cell. This was a very cool, iconic moment everybody remembers and loves, and then they never let Gohan do anything cool again. See, there's this unspoken, or possibly spoken, and I just haven't been paying attention, rule in fighting anime that no two fights can ever be the same. If the first fight had your hero on the ropes before they unleashed their superpowered evil side and wiped the floor with the enemy, then the next fight cannot go the same way. Maybe they do the superpowered evil side, but oh no, this time it's too evil and they have to put it back. Or the power creep solution, they do the superpowered evil side thing, but this villain is just too strong and the superpowers are useless against them. Or the villain has some kind of control over the superpowered evil side and using it against them is exactly what they want. Or in the more boring cases, the hero just waits an unreasonably long time before activating the superpowered evil side to let them win, etc, etc. There is usually a Watsonian reason the same trick can never work more than once, but the real reason is just that, well, the writer thinks that'd be boring. And most of the time, they're right. Jumping back to Bleach real quick, there was a fairly early appearance of the superpowered evil side that was very dramatic, where it popped up in the middle of a very dramatic fight, and then Ichigo heroically fought it off and apologized to his enemy for the interruption in possibly the funniest moment in the show. And then in a filler arc, like 30 episodes later, the exact same thing happened beat for beat. It even starts with him catching the bad guy's sword and then looking up all, oh, look, I'm evil now, look at my mask. And the number of people who like Bleach and really liked that first moment, but felt it got really cheap because then it happened exactly the same again, but worse, kind of demonstrates that this trope really does need to be mixed up on every use or it just ends up getting tired. Anyway, most of the actual interesting development comes from the other side of the trope, the evil bit, because a superpowered evil side can be evil in a lot of different ways. Some of them are functionally split personalities that are internally at war with the protagonist, and resolving that might involve some kind of character development or personal growth, or just a symbolic battle in the center of the mind where they have a sword fight or something. These split personalities also sometimes get up to stuff that the main personality doesn't know about. It was actually surprisingly common for a while to give supervillains innocent alter egos who literally didn't know about their own supervillainy. It's also surprisingly common for characters with amnesia to end up with their original memories and personalities serving as a superpowered evil side, where they find out they used to be really badass but also totally morally bankrupt and end up struggling with basically their original version for control. Some stories take this split to its logical conclusion and make the superpowered evil side some kind of totally separate possessing entity that basically has a timeshare on the hero's brain, and the hero gets a sweet power-up at the expense of having to try and kick them out when they start making themselves at home in their brain. But some of these superpowered evil sides are more like just the regular character, but way angrier and with zero inhibitions. These versions will usually share the character's most basic priorities. A love interest showing up might dissuade them from further evil, for instance. But the trade-off is any kind of carefully curated personal code or whatever that might matter to the character probably goes straight out the window. If your happy-go-lucky hero very specifically doesn't kill, for instance, they might have a doozy of a time restraining training themselves when the power-up fairy visits and switches that off for the day. And even if the character doesn't have any, like, deeply held personal creeds for the superpowered evil side to ignore, an otherwise chill and usually nice hero can still end up dishing out a startling amount of damage when they drop the chill and niceness for a minute. And some superpowered evil sides are basically feral. Instead of being the character but meaner, it's more like the character's not home right now, can their primal instincts take a message? This is like the werewolf approach to the superpowered evil side, kind of a beast within scenario. In some cases, a split personality superpowered evil side might temporarily get re purposed as one of these if the hero nearly dies and they transform as a survival mechanism. Once again, the most powerful fix for this is the power of love. A conveniently placed love interest can often convince the rampaging protagonist to chill out and calm down. And the drama of a completely uncontrollable rampaging force of nature turning back into a good guy to avoid hurting their one true love is the kind of narrative play that really gets the shippers out in force. It's good for drama, is what I'm saying. One popular non-anime example of a superpowered evil side is a Spider-Man classic you're probably familiar with, the Venom symbiote. What Peter initially thinks is just a fancy black suit with infinite webbing and a quick change feature, turns out to actually be a sentient alien parasite influencing his personality towards evil, or at least towards self-centered motivations. While the symbiote is a character in their own right and has been portrayed many different ways across different media, the symbiote is usually at least a little bit evil, though how that manifests varies a lot from story to story. Usually the way the story goes is the symbiote starts off working as a superpowered evil side for a generally heroic nice dude Peter Parker, before escalating in villainy and getting kicked out of his brain in a dramatic battle in the center of the mind and slinking off to bond with Peter's estranged former friend Eddie Brock becoming the supervillain Venom. In the legendary work of cinema that is Spider-Man 3, the symbiote initially functions as a type 2 superpowered evil side, lowering Peter's inhibitions and making him angrier and more of a dick. Although this Peter is also a huge dork, so the symbiote just kind of makes him an even bigger dork. But in some versions, like the one in the cartoon Spectacular Spider-Man, it's more of a type 1, where the symbiote starts off pretty much mindless, but develops a personality of its own and starts acting out more and more, leading to one very noteworthy fight where Spider-Man takes out the entire Sinister Six with terrifying efficiency, all while completely silent. And then we find 
find out that Peter was actually asleep the whole time, and the symbiote took his body out for a crime-fighting joyride. That's spooky. Peter no likey. Now, while it may seem a bit redundant, some villains actually have superpowered evil sides. In rare cases, the villain is usually actually pretty nice, maybe even heroic. But right now, the superpowered evil side is in charge, and that's the one you gotta watch out for. But sometimes, this is more like a second form in a boss fight. The relatively manageable bad guy you were dealing with just whipped out a backup personality with a totally different moveset, and now you're in a world of trouble. So this trope has a few corollary tropes that show up wherever it does. By far the most relevant one is fighting from the inside, a catch-all trope for a character under some kind of control using heroic willpower to resist it. This can be subtle, like a single dramatic tear falling from their otherwise dispassionate face, or it can be really unsubtle, which usually means a lot of yelling and head clutching. Hell, sometimes we actually zoom into their head to see them symbolically fighting the superpowered evil side for control, typically known as a battle in the center of the mind. This gets used with every superpowered evil side variant, but it sees the most mileage with the split personality and the feral variants, since those are the ones where you can most easily make the argument that the hero is trapped in their own mind. If nothing seems to be working to snap them out of it, that usually just means a love interest is about to tearfully drop a love confession that the hero may or may not remember when they instantly snap out of it. Remember, it's all about the drama. <laughs> just once, just once I want to see the hero's non-love interest bestie who just got their ass kicked to show how out of control they really are to get really cranky that their desperate plea to their humanity wasn't enough to get them to stop being evil. Anyway, sometimes the fighting from the inside thing gets some outside help with a good old-fashioned I know you're in there somewhere fight, where the other heroes kick the crap out of the superpowered evil side until it goes away. This is harder than most I know you're in there somewhere fights because the superpowered evil side is still superpowered and typically strong enough to take out whatever bad guy was kicking the good guys around before, so it might end up being a bit more of a token effort to guilt the currently evil character into fighting from the inside even harder. Or sometimes a more noble antagonist might show up and be like, oh, the hero is not themselves, and then kick their ass until they stop and then leave. It's pretty funny whenever that happens. And for the benefit of the audience, sometimes we get an actual look inside said character's head and get to see some mildly symbolic representation of their inner turmoil. This is usually pretty ham-fisted, like we're not exactly going to be surprised to see our hero fighting a scary palette-swapped version of themselves or some kind of beast. Still, this whole trope is built on drama, and nothing is better for drama than just physically showing us someone's deep-seated internal struggle in a literal visual metaphor. Uh, no, no, wait. I read that wrong. Plenty of things are better for drama than that, but there's nothing wrong with a little ham-fistedness once in a while. Anyway, the main difficulty with this trope is power creep. But more than that, there are two contrasting problems that can really hurt this trope. The superpowered evil side can just get tired from repeated use, but it can also become unreliable or boring if it's constantly being reworked or discarded in favor of some new power-up. The overuse problem is obvious. The first time your hero heroically fights off their superpowered evil side and trades the power-up for keeping their humanity, that's really cool. But the second time it plays out the exact same way, it's a lot less cool. This trope, like all tropes is a tool, and if you use it the exact same way twice, it can lose the impact. But that doesn't mean it needs to be fundamentally changed every time. Lots of writers keep evolving the superpowered evil side so it never manifests the same way twice, which is theoretically workable but can also result in a Super Saiyan scenario, where it just gets totally nerfed after its debut and loses all potential drama and future exploration. The superpowered evil side can evolve over time, but it can also just be a consistent character trait like any other ability or flaw. Like any character trait, while it can change and develop, it doesn't need to in order to keep the character interesting. We just need to see how it works in different situations. Like, maybe we've seen how it works in a straight fight. It takes over, kicks ass, then goes away again. But what about if the heroes are trapped and suddenly the superpowered evil side kicks in from the stress and now the heroes are locked in with it? That's a whole different ballgame. Or this new villain wants to draw out the superpowered evil side, so it's not the automatic win condition for the fight. There's all kinds of ways to play with this trope without having to constantly upgrade or rework it that doesn't involve dulling it with repeated use. It's a difficult balance to strike, but when done right, it can make for some really fun character drama. So, yeah. And thanks again to Campfire Blaze for sponsoring this video. Campfire Blaze is a browser-based tool suite designed to help you keep your writing organized all in one place. Gone are the days of thumbtacks, red string, and conspiracy boards connecting notes you wrote on cocktail napkins. It's the future, baby. Now you can just put your stuff on the internet. Blaze comes with a word processor, character sheets, character arcs, and story timelines to let you flesh out your manuscripts and plot. And you can also world build your settings out with maps, locations, and encyclopedia, languages, magic, items, and more. You can work by yourself, no problem, and keep your world totally private, but if you want to show it off to the public or collab with your friends in real time, you can do that too. Campfire Blaze lets you visually organize your storytelling, which is very valuable for us disorganized creative types. Blaze's free version is already pretty stacked with features, but if you want more, you can build your own subscription and only pay for the features you need. Modules can be added for as little as 50 cents, or if you want everything, you can get the full experience for just a few dollars a month. Campfire Blaze is free during its October open beta, so if you're interested, check out the link in the description below.